numbers. But I think it's helpful, because we talk about millions and billions and trillions, I think it's helpful to just understand that the, the trillions we're talking about is really 42% of every dollar um, we're spending. Okay, another issue just uh, comes up a lot is who owns our debt? What, what, what countries, what, you know, who, who's buying this money? Who controls it? So in 1970, 5% of our debt was owned by foreign countries. In 1990, 19% of our debt was held by foreign countries. And in 2010, 47% of our debt was held by foreign countries. Now the challenge there is not just from a strategic standpoint or from a uh, you know, from a stability standpoint with the country being be sold, so beholden to the finances of other countries. It's also challenging to start thinking about the interest. So you look, remember back in that first pie chart, we're paying about 200 and some uh, billion dollars a year in interest. In the next 10 years, we are estimated to pay about 800 trillion dollars, or 800 billion dollars, excuse me, or more in interest, nearing up towards a trillion dollars. So when you think about that, when half of that debt is owned by foreign countries, and a fourth of that debt is owned by by China alone, and we're in a we're in a position where we start paying a trillion dollars in interest every year, that means everyone in this room who gets up and works whatever variety of a business you're in, you're going to spend a portion of your day sending money to China or to other countries and to service the debt of other spending. Which means instead of building schools or roads or paying for Head Start or doing research here, we're going to do those things in other countries because we're going to be sending them money. It's going to be the largest transfer of wealth out of the United States in a generation. And so the challenge is, is how do we get a hold of this thing given the, the, the serious situation we're in given the sort of structural deficits we're in, and the interest that's going to continue to mount and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so this is, just, this is just interesting as we have this debate. And we looked at the two pie charts. We know that to resolve the deficit, every part of the pie has to be involved. That means defense. That means non-defense. That means entitlement spending. That means everything has to be involved as we deal with the, the explosive cost. One of the things that's really challenging for us, and both parties have this, the president's admitted this, both parties have said that uh, the entitlement programs are, are going to ultimately bankrupt uh, the country because of the, the way that we're structured right now. You can see the projected tax revenue. You can go back to 1970. It's been pretty low. Uh, you've got some ups and downs, but it's been roughly between you know, 15 to 20 percent right in there. And it doesn't really matter where you are. <coughs> Excuse me, if you're on the lower end, you hit the point about right here. If you're on the upper end, you hit the point right there where these three programs take up every dollar that the federal government spends. That means before you spend a dollar on debt interest payments, before you spend a dollar on domestic programs, before you spend a dollar on defense, we're already running a deficit with those three programs. And so both parties have had this discussion. Both parties know that we're in a challenge when we have 10,000 baby boomers that retire every day. Um, we don't have a growing workforce. Uh, we have immigration policies in this country that are broken that don't bring in a, a legal growing workforce. Uh, and so we're in a challenge to try to figure out how to uh, pay for these expanding programs going forward. So our debt is a share of GDP from about 1940 to now. So this is at a gross domestic product. In World War II was sort of our peak. In the middle of the uh, war, we, our debt went up 100% uh, of its gross domestic product. And it sort of came along here, and it was, it was down here, down the 80s, up in the 90s a bit. Uh, level in 2000s and then down and up, we've got a spike now uh, in the debt. It's the second highest debt the share of GDP we've had since, uh, since World War I, World War II. And the challenge is, is that we're in a situation now where if we could somehow manage these costs, if we could somehow figure out a way to uh, balance this budget going forward, we can avoid this next crisis. And this is according to the office of OMB CBO that with the exploding costs of so many more retirees and exploding costs of health care in this country, that we are at a point where I believe the computer that runs this uh, runs this scenario breaks down about this point where no one believes you could feasibly handle a debt uh, this high in this country uh, and continue to function. We just there's not enough gross domestic product. There's not enough money being generated. There's not enough wealth in the country, no matter how you slice the uh, slice this thing, to afford uh, this scenario. And so we're faced with some choices. Uh, I'm going to give you one of the proposals out there. It's, I know there are multiple proposals, and we're going to talk about the President's proposal. My hope is that some of you who have uh, positions on either side 
we'll, we'll share those in an articulate, intelligent manner. We can have a little debate, and we'll all learn from each other, and we'll have a chance to actually do what we're supposed to in this country, which is have a democratic system where we discuss issues. So, according to the OMB and the CDO that we have, the, the, if we make modifications to, to spending, we begin to reduce spending, we begin to make modifications uh, to preserve Medicare and Medicaid, uh, we will reduce the deficit in a pretty significant way. So that's where that takes us. Now, the cost of waiting is a big deal. Because every, every year that we wait, uh, the, the cost of not fixing it sooner, it's just like anything, when you're handling debt and interest, if you don't handle it today, it starts to compound and get worse. This, these are the unfunded, this is the fiscal gap, the unfunded amount of dollars uh, between uh, uh, all these separate programs, the amount of I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. This is the gap between what we're going to pay in and what we're obligated to pay out. So in 2009, 62.9 trillion. Uh, 2010, 76.4 trillion. Uh, 2011, 99.4 trillion. So the cost of waiting, the cost of not making the decisions and fixing these problems, whichever way you want to fix it, is is a big challenge. Uh, and everyone knows that if we don't, if we, if we can deal with these things on our terms today or we can deal with them on, on uh, our later terms, and, and it'll be made for us. So passive prosperity is a way in which, which uh, we believe we create efficient, effective, responsible government, we strengthen the social safety, preserve Medicare uh, and Medicaid going forward, we fill the mission of health and retirement security for all Americans, and we have pro-growth and tax reform. Now, there's some discussion about taxes, and, and there's a lot of discussion about taxes, and the, and the question comes up a lot, and this gentleman here, the question comes up a lot, is why don't we raise taxes on big oil and the rich in this country yeah. and solve yeah. this problem? Yeah. So, that, so that, that comes up a lot in the conversation. And the, 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 the facts are, oh, the facts are, and then we'll have a chance for folks to give their intelligent rebuttals. Uh, the facts are that for uh, the, the president's proposal to tax big oil generates $20 billion over 10 years. It's $2 billion a year. Now we're talking about $1.6 trillion. Okay? We're talking about $1.6 trillion. And I, and I promise if everybody will wait, you can have, everybody can have a chance to give a, give a common response. Hey, I, I understand there's, there's two sides to this debate. So, Two billion dollars, and then the proposal to raise taxes on the upper one percent, let that let the tax cut expire for that portion, raises sixty billion dollars a year, or six hundred billion dollars over ten years. So what you end up having is a situation where you cannot raise taxes enough to meet these problems. In fact, it's been it was reported in the news just a couple weeks ago that if you raise taxes on everyone making over a hundred thousand dollars to a hundred percent, you still run a deficit. So, so, so the point is that we're going. We cannot. We cannot tax our way out of this problem. We're going to have to have. We're going to have to have reforms. We're going to have to find ways to save money and cut costs. And it's part of the problem. Now, some discussions have been who pays the tax burden. Um, this is an editorial just to just to show you so we all know what we're talking about here. You have the you have the, the bottom fifty percent pay three percent. The top one percent pay thirty-eight percent. The top top five percent pay fifty-nine percent. The top twenty-five percent pay eighty-six percent, and the top fifty percent of taxpayers pay ninety-seven percent of tax burden. <laughs>